we celebrate the 65th anniversary on Wednesday. Uh, the 65th anniversary of our people standing up uh, for us, for our rights, protecting us and our homeland, uh, protecting our neighbors. And, uh, you know, in, I, I was asked earlier this week about my reflections on Hayes Pond. And, and what I told the lady was, I don't know what life was like back in the 1950s. Um, I can imagine that, that it was still part of the Jim Crow South. I can imagine that racism was still rampant. Um, you know, uh, I've had many talks with my grandparents over the years, and uh, they always reminded me of having to go to the, the back of stores uh, to get medicine and, and uh, you know, having to go to separate restrooms and uh, just certain places that they would not go to, period, uh, because they, they, were, they, they, they were not allowed and they were not wanted. And, um, and so I don't know what life was like back in the 50s, but I can imagine that in 2023, uh, life's a whole lot better for Native people and for minorities as a whole. Um, and so as we reflect back on, on that night, uh, 65 years ago, um, I'm glad that we have individuals like Mr. Jack Lowry join us, uh, Dr. Jim Jones join us, two individuals who are highly successful in their fields um, um, and who have accomplished a lot throughout their careers. But on one fateful night, 65 years ago, they were together. They were together along with a, a, a host of other Lumbees um, who, who came together and who fought for us and our people. And I always like to tell others um, that the Klan hasn't been back to Robson County <laughs> since, since, since that time period. And, um, and it's because of individuals like Mr. Jim, Dr. Jim, and uh, Mr. Lowry. So um, with that being said, I do want to just get the, the ball rolling here. Um, we may have some time at the end for some questions. Uh, if not, it's fine because I know these, these two gentlemen are going to, are going to tell us, uh, you know, all, all about that night and, and are going to fill us in on some stuff. And, and I'm definitely looking forward to the next hour. So at this time, um, Mr. Jack, will you just start us off by just telling us a little okay. bit about yourself? Um, as we say among our tribal members, who's your people? Where where are you from? And then after that, uh, Dr. Dr. Jones will go over to you, and then we will go on into our discussion. Okay, my name is Jack Lowry, and I prefer being called just Jack. I grew up, my father's name was Zeb Lowry, my mother's name was Fanny, and I had uh, four brothers, no sisters. I grew up right across from uh, the uh, university, uh, almost within uh, uh, rock throwing distance, but I grew up there and of course I graduated from uh, Pembroke State College and uh, then entered law school in Tennessee and uh, became a lawyer. I'm now a practicing a criminal lawyer in uh, Tennessee and uh, been doing that for several years. Uh, taking you back to in 1958, I was a senior in a college there in Pembroke when this incident occurred. Uh, and uh, so that I've got some authentication about it, I'm going to show you my uh, warrior medal that somebody sent me uh, some time back. Uh, it's a medal of appreciation, uh, but it's a medal from the, uh, it's a Lumbee warrior medal. So uh, they sent me that some time back, and I've treasured it and kept it. So uh, as I can tell you, uh, and Jim can tell you, I was in the mix of the battle, so to speak, that night. And uh, I remember uh, not everything that happened, but uh, quite a bit that happened. Um, uh, one of the things that happened to me is I, I got arrested. I'll tell you about that later, but uh, that is one of the things that happened. But um, uh, this was a, a situation where I think, as you stated in the opening statement, it brought some respect to our people. And uh, uh, we let people know across the country that the Lumbee people were good, but you didn't push them. They were good people. And that night we kind of proved that you didn't push us. And uh, I think it was so embarrassing for the Klan that they disbanded after that incident occurred. And uh, 
Uh, I'm going to yield the floor to Jim, uh, but we get back into the details. Uh, I'd like to uh, reiterate some of the exact details that I remember happening uh, that day, that Saturday, and that Saturday night, because uh, I think it is worth remembering. Jim, I'm going to yield the floor to you if it's okay. Well, for, first of all, uh, Jack was very modest uh, in uh, describing his own background. He's a past uh, state legislator in Tennessee. He's also one of the co-founders of Cracker Barrel, uh, for which he was chairman of their board for several years. He's a dear friend of mine, uh, two years behind me in school, but I was uh, a classmate of his brother, Earl. Uh, having said that, I I think Jack's given you a great introduction. I would like to know, Mr. Chairman, how, how much time are we to fill? Well, we had to sit up for an hour. So so from, from now until 11, but, uh, but hey, if the spirit hits us, as we say here, we'll keep on rolling, okay? You, you, well, enough. An hour is not long enough, but I know, uh, yep. <laughs> we'll, we'll do the best, best we can. You yes, have, sir. One lawyer and one ex preacher, so if you want to have a hard time. Absolutely. Well, if we can get into the factual situation of what occurred, I'll I'll give a, a brief background. Yes, sir. Um, I think this incident had, and I haven't heard many people allude to this. I think the origin of this problem started with a judge in Lumberton, North Carolina, who was trying to divorce case. And then the proof, it came out that uh, the woman was having a relationship with an Indian uh, man. And the judge made a statement from the bench that he couldn't understand why uh, a white woman would have a relationship with an Indian. And that sort of got, that word got over to catfish uh, the, the Klan man in South Carolina and I'm informed now, I'm just speaking from information that I've uh, heard, uh, that that was the thing that sort of caused them to come over in Robertson County and think that they could hold a rally. And uh, so that was how the thing got started from my perception. And as I said at that time, I was in college. But I remember that Saturday, uh, it had upset people to the point that they had bought all of the ammunition out of the hardware stores in Pembroke, the Indians had. And uh, you could tell there was going to be a fight and there was going to be some trouble. And uh, I remember the sheriff, I think his name was McLeod, but I'm not sure of that. That's came right, Jim. Is that right, Jim? That's right. Yeah, he came to Pembroke on that Saturday morning trying to quell the situation, uh, but he didn't have much success. Because uh, I think he saw uh, a dangerous situation developing. Uh, and of course, it uh, it was all talked around the town that they were coming. And I was uh, a senior, as I said, and I ended up over at the college with Dr. Gale, who was the president. And um, for some reason, he had gotten himself involved in it to the point that he was helping us plan out some strategy about how to handle this situation. He'd had some military training, but he's also the president of the college and he was a white man. But I remember meeting over in his office on that Saturday morning and we developed a plan uh, because they were gonna hold this meeting in a, in a large field that had broom straw. And our plan and what he uh, uh, set up to do, there was four of us, we were gonna go in and check the wind and we we're gonna set the field on fire, which in effect would have uh, burn their platform and whatever else they had. But um, that was our plan. And when I got up there that night and we were getting into position, the Lowry boy, they had put a big light up on the platform. The Lowry boy uh, had a shotgun. I'm informed. I saw a picture of this later. We were in the backfield getting ready to set the field on fire, but he shot out the big light. And when he did, Everybody went together and you could hear gunshots and this type of thing. And we abandoned our uh, situation at that time because it looked like our situation wasn't gonna work. They were already into the fight. 
and we went running back up to the uh, place where uh, the activity was going on. And unbeknown to everybody, I think at that point, the governor had gotten word of this situation and uh, the possible danger, and he had placed on the perimeter, uh, I've been informed about 50 uh, highway patrolmen, North Carolina highway patrolmen. Long story short, when the fighting started, and Jim, you, you can come in. I know you were up there with your cousin, Sonny, but uh, you can step in at this point and I'll back off and you tell them your version and I'll come back on about what happened to me. Well, hey. hold, hold on, hold on, hold on, just, just, just a, a, a second, Dr. Jones. So Jack, so, so the sheriff's been there, words out. Um, you, you said that you'd already been over to see the chancellor. You know, you guys have, have, have talked about a strategy. You, you, you said, Hey, you know, let's go set the field on fire. Uh, let's go ahead and, and like and, and do a little preemptive type strike. Right. Uh, can you can you sort of tell us how that discussion unfolded as you guys were strategizing and and and, and talking? What, what 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 was maybe some of the other ideas or suggestions at that time as y'all were talking it out? Well, what I remembered was uh, Dr. Gale, the president, was sort of the leader of the discussion. We were just okay. uh, uh, we were going to be the team that. That carried it out, but he was laying out the plan, and that's uh, it's kind of uh, revealing that even though he was a white man, he's president of the college, but uh, he was engaging himself into the right. fight pretty well. There's no question. Uh, I don't remember us having any other alternatives except uh, I think we visited the field, or somebody had and knew about the broom straw, and yeah. so uh, they knew if if we got on the right side of the wind, I've seen fields like that catch on fire. Mm -hmm. Our idea was to just burn them out, uh, and uh, that, of course, it never materialized because the shooting started before we could light the match, and um, uh, that took us back up, and I think it was Marvin Lowry's brother, uh, I was informed, that shot out that light, but he probably saved a lot of lives, lives that night because there was some people that were armed. Uh, I, I had a weapon. Uh, uh, and and uh, a lot of other people had weapons, and if it hadn't if it hadn't gone into that darkness, uh, and everybody ran together, I'm not sure that uh, there would have been a killing of some kind. Jim, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Did you have a question, Mr. Chairman? I'm sorry. Oh no, I was I was I was going to ask just just a quick follow up. Um, how how many of our folks do you think had weapons? Uh, uh percentage wise, how how many do you think came armed? that night i would say i would say probably 90 uh excluding the women right. uh and i would say some of the women had uh some of the women had gone up there and gotten involved in it a little bit yeah. but uh, yeah. uh, i remember some lady i heard talking about it i didn't see many women that night well right. it was when yeah. it went dark we got into a pretty significant fight um, yes sir and they were trying to, the, the clan was trying to leave, but the, the field they were in was a sandy field. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, it, the cars were having trouble getting out. When they decided they wanted to leave, they were having trouble getting out. And so what we were doing as they were trying to leave, we were opening the car doors on the driver's side and having some significant physical contact with the clan. In other words, we were trying to beat the hell out of them and mm -hmm. we were mm -hmm. doing a pretty good job. Right. And right. they were trying to leave, they were trying to run, some of them were having, but you have to imagine too, in the middle of all of this, these highway patrolmen ascended onto the proposition and, and they got involved. Mm -hmm. so, let me, um, uh, let me uh, follow up a little bit. Yes, sir, Dr. Jones. Adding to uh, Jack's comments, uh, from knowledge that I have, it's pretty reliable that uh, actually the sheriff McLeod uh, had uh, had a discourse with the leadership of the uh, folks that he knew in the Indian community and had agreed that he would hold his people off for 15 minutes. He would give the Lumbees 15 minutes to take care of business. Okay. Then he would move in, and that, and that was the reason. 
uh, that uh, the people were standing back. My story is, is a little bit different from, from Jack's. Um, uh, I was a second year medical student at Wake Forest. Uh, I had been through a lot of problems because I was the first Native American ever admitted to Wake Forest or to their medical school. And so I was a very uh, nervous about uh, anything that might cause me to stand out or be noticed. Uh, my cousin, Lonnie Revels, Lonnie Revels Jr., mm -hmm. who unfortunately died way too soon, um, was two years behind me, a pre-law student uh, at Wake Forest undergraduate. Both, both campuses, although they're divided, are in Winston-Salem. I got a call from, from Lonnie one afternoon, and he said, uh, how long since you've been home? And I said, it's been several months because uh, I'm studying hard, stay in medical school. We had been told by the dean of the school that one third of us would, would be flunked out before we finished. And I figured uh, I had to prove that I was smarter than a third of the rest of the dudes. So I was studying hard. Uh, Lonnie said, you've got to go home. We've got to go home uh, this weekend. I said, why do we got to go home for? He said, haven't you heard anything? I said, I'm telling you, I'm studying, man. <laughs> he said, uh, uh, well, the Klan is, is going to come down and, and try to beat up on our tribe and, and we're going to show them something. I, I said, well, good. Let me know how it comes out. He said, no, you got to go. I said, I, man, I'm going to get, all I need is for my dean to read in the newspaper. One of his students is down there <laughs> inciting a riot. <laughs> and my butt will be clean back to Boston County. I said, I can't do it, Jack. And he kept on, he kept on. He said, who in the world is ever going to know that you went to Robinson County? Nobody knows or cares. So he picked me up and we came down and, and uh, Jack had more adequately describes Pembroke when we pulled in front of uh, what was then Pate Supply Company, everybody, everybody was walking up and down the street, flashing weapons of very, various kind, uh, from a hand grenade, which I saw, all to knives and shotguns, a high-powered rifle. And one the guy looked at me and said, what are you packing? I said, packing what? What are you talking about? I, I, we never owned anything in a gun when in my family I had owned an air rifle uh, but uh, other than that I didn't know anything about weapons and so and the guy says I'll fix that and shortly somebody appeared with a rifle gave me a rifle and a pistol so and if you see uh, it ended up with my picture in Life magazine I have a trench coat on and the reason for that was to hide the shotgun and <laughs> And, the, and the, so we came to the meeting. Uh, my dumb self uh, didn't know what to expect. So Lonnie and I were on the front row for a very within three feet of where those, the guy was about to shoot out the light. Mm. And uh, he uh, <clears throat> was very convincing. Uh, he first, put the gun to the guy's head and asked him if he were prepared to die. Mm. And uh, the guy remained muted and, and didn't answer. Uh, and uh, he then uh, proceeded to uh, uh, put the gun against the one strand uh, light on the back of a some kind of an antenna was one bulb of light and he shot out the light. When he shot out the light, uh, I have never been, although I served a term 
in the Navy, I never was in combat, but it sounded like I would assume combat sounds like for probably, um, Jack can comment on this, uh, two or three minutes, not very long, although at the time it seemed like an hour. Uh, but there were, there were thousands of, of firing weapons. Uh, it was pure darkness. It was not only moonlit night, it was very dark night. And um, I'm still standing up there gazing at the, at the fight in front of me when Lonnie jerked me down and put me between two cars or, or I might have been the first catch. The remarkable thing to me, and I'm a religious guy and I give credit to God, uh, only God's prevention kept someone from getting killed. They were at close range, multiple weapons, firing sometimes I would assume at each other uh, without hitting anybody. I think that's remarkable. Uh, after they, sh this car, lone car was parked out in the middle of this uh, field. They shot out every, every piece of glass. They shot out all the tires. They riddled uh, the, the, all, all the other rest of the car uh, with uh, bullet holes. Someone yelled, here comes the Grand Wizard who was parked in the, the back of the lot. Mm. And as he came across, and how what kept him from getting killed in itself was a miracle because they unleashed all of their gunfire uh, on the, who was purported to be uh, the, the leader catfish hunter, as, as John, as Jack had said. But he, um, he kept going, he's driving his car. They shot out all the tires. So he drove out of there as hard as he could go on the rims of his car. Uh, and, uh, and you hear him clanking down the highway. Uh, and uh, I'll stop there with this, another part of the story. So just listening to, to you guys talk and just taking us down that you know memory lane, um, I... Once again, you know, I, I always try to put history into the context, like what was going on during that time period, right? What was happening in the 1950s here in the United States, here in North Carolina. And so as you guys, Dr. Jim, as you're making that drive down, you know, from, from, from uh, the University of Wake Forest, Jack, as you're, as, you, as, you're, as you're walking around town, as you're visiting the chancellor, the president uh, of the college, like, what is going through y'all's minds as far as, hey, you know, we're, we're young, but now, you know, this is still the South, you know, it's the Klan. What's going through y'all's mind as you're building up and leading up to that moment of being there at Hayes Pond? Well, I'll take that on. I, I will tell you that what was going in my mind, I was uh, at the age I was and a senior in college, uh, I was interested in having a good fight. That right. I have to, I have <laughs> yeah. to confess. Yeah. I, okay. I don't know that I had any. The way the the climate was in Pembroke yes, tonight, it was like going to watch a train wreck. You know, you're going to go and you're going to get involved if you can. So, I think my interest as a young man at that time was, I thought we're going to have a pretty good fight, and I don't want to miss it. So, yeah. I don't know that I was thinking anything racial at that time or beyond that. Yes, sir. I, I just knew the Klan was coming to our county and it was an insult. And uh, everybody felt it to be an insult and we were going to do something about it. So yes, sir. It that kind of attitude uh, that, that prevailed with me at the time. And I know that as Jim described it and this thing began to break, mm -hmm. uh, what I recalled at some point, the highway patrol did come in. Yes, sir. And we were having a big time beating up on some of the clan in the cars. And I was so active that one of the highway patrolmen grabbed me and said something to the effect, boy, you're, you're really active tonight. Well, I had a weapon on me and I don't know yet. And then the second one got me and they were taking me off. 
Uh, and at that point, there was a boy named Smith that lived in Pembroke up by the railroad track. I can't think of his first name. But he came running by me and those two highway patrolmen, our troopers, and he had an M1, uh, a military rifle. I don't know exactly what it was. I guess he got it somewhere from Fort Bragg from somebody. But he came running by us and fell on the ground like a soldier does and pointed that rifle. Well, they had more interest in him at that time than they did me, and they turned me loose to get him. And when they turned me loose, they didn't see me again. So that was, I, I got out of there, but I do remember, uh, I saw the picture of Shell Work and, uh, and uh, Simeon Oxendine. I knew both of these individuals and I knew what kind of people they were. And they were, they were there's some tough guys up there that night. There's some tough Indians. And uh, yes, again, what was happening, uh, we were getting pushed. Yep. We decided to push back and we did. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, I, I think I think I think you, you definitely answered my question, right? It's, it's hey, you know, yes, uh, uh, it's the fifties and and stuff. But at the same point, you were at, we were at a, at a time as a tribe and and also in your personal life where it was hey, we're not going to take this. We're going to stand. We're going to fight. No one's coming in here to push us around, and they're going to have to understand that before they leave here tonight, they're going to know that they have been a uh, 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 faced with a bunch of lumbies. And if they ever think about it again, uh, they're, they're think hard, right, about coming back here. So, so that was the climate at that point here among our people was we're ready to fight and we're going to fight. And come hill or high water, the clan will know that they have faced the Lumbee tribe tonight. Good, so, Don, I think that's probably true of all oppressed people. Uh, I think they all dream. Uh, and Really, what gives them energy is the thought that someday they'll be liberated. Absolutely. I think that what Jack has said is true. We felt that we were going to have a good fight uh, and that um, uh, at least I was raised with the understanding, and it's been confirmed by friends of mine in the Highway Patrol that I, highway patrolman, the worst assignment you could get in the North Carolina Highway Patrol is to be assigned to Robinson County because they were literally afraid. The patrolmen were afraid of the, of the Indians. And, and this was going to be one more stage. Uh, I think that all oppressed people look for a day of their liberation. And that this was taken on the feel that this was what was going to happen in Hayes Bond. Mr. Chairman, I, I think one other thing uh, along with what uh, uh, Dr. Jones just said, uh, the press had gotten very interested in this incident and it turned out to be a tremendous embarrassment to the Klan. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I recall was the Charlotte Observer, this is on Saturday night. I think it was on the Sunday paper, it might've been a week later, but they showed a cartoon of uh, the wizard of the Ku Klux Klan mm -hmm. running on a map between North Carolina and South Carolina. And he was running across the line and he had an arrow stuck in his buttock. <laughs> so uh, that it, it, it got some real positive press. And it was, a, it was a matter of pride for the Lumbee Indians because we had always been characterized as people who would fight. I mean, yes, I've, I've heard that it, in Tennessee, uh, people learned that I came from Pembroke and they'd say, yeah, uh, we've heard those uh, about the Indians down there. Uh, they're mean or they'll fight. And I said, yeah, I agree, they will if you push them. So we were the kind of people that got to prove on that instance that you don't come in our county with that kind of attitude and that kind of perception and think that you're gonna rub that in our face because we've had a lot of things rubbed in our face. But that was that was sort of the end of that. And, and so as a, as a result of this incident, the Indian people were able to develop a lot of pride and let people know, hey, we're individuals, we're good people, but we won't bother you, but you're not gonna bother, you're not gonna push us. And that's the word that came down. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, um, Dr. Jones, so the night is transpiring. 
um, you know, our people are fighting. Um, and now here comes the, the local authorities. They're now starting to come in, uh, grabbing, you know, pushing people apart and stuff. Uh, so what what all happens next as, as the authorities come down, as they're breaking it up? What's happening now? Well, uh, Lonnie and I didn't run. And yeah. that might have saved our lives from from being in, uh, incarcerated or whatever. That really would have gotten me kicked out of medical school. I, I can tell you that. But, they, um, but they, we just stay put. We were on the front line. We just stay put till it sort of died down. And uh, we saw the uh, Grand Wizard's car leaving and people started getting to their cars to chase him down the, the road. And I don't know whatever became of him. I, I do know that he escaped without any harm and was, uh, I later happened to be on vacation from school when he had his trial. So I eagerly sat through the trial in Lumberton where he was tried and found guilty. Uh, but there's, there's another kind of uh, humorous ending to my story about how this all ended for me. Yes, sir. If you have time, I'll tell yes, it. Yeah. So when we get back to, to school, uh, and I prayed that it would, nobody would ever hear about it, but as Jack said, it was all over the, the newspaper and everybody was congratulating me for what the Lumbees had done. Right. I got real quiet about it and pretended to know only what I'd read uh, in the paper. And Lonnie calls me again. And he said, I, before he started the conversation, I said, I'm not going back to Pembroke. And he, he said, have you seen the, the Life magazine? And I, I said, oh, gosh. The bad feeling came over me. And I said, I have not. He said, we're in the magazine. I said, what happened to nobody will ever know? I'm <laughs> so I go out and bar. It's the first time that I didn't know that there were different issues of the magazine. So when I go down, I buy a Life magazine. And uh, as Jack mentioned, the two, Simeon and some other guy were, we're on the front cover of the, of the magazine. And on the article, there, I, there it stands. And the guy's about to shoot out the light. And the camera in the background, it happens to stop between me and Lonnie. Hmm. Lonnie's in the picture. And I'm not in the picture. And I said, hallelujah. So I go back confident that I have not been found out. About another another week went by, uh -huh. and, and the uh, the secretary to the dean called me and said, uh, "Jim, uh, dean would like to see you in his office, please." And I thought, "Oh my gosh!" Mm -hmm. At this time, I did I didn't have the knowledge that I had been uh, not only the first Native American but the first minority ever admitted by Wake Forest. So I, but the dean, of course, knew that. And I go down to visit uh, with the dean, wonderful man. And he said, how are you doing, son? I said, fine. What are you doing? I said, I'm studying hard. He said, have you been home lately? I said, no, sir, I'm too busy studying to go home. <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, he said, well, uh, I heard about the Ku Klux Klan being done it. I said, yes, sir. Uh, they got taught a lesson. He said, well, can, can you come around the desk here? I want to show you something. So I walked around his desk and he said, who is this fellow right here? He pointed. And in this issue of the magazine, the camera came one more click around. And there I stood as far as, as, as I could be, as I could be. And I, um, uh, uh, and so he, he, they had me there. So the dean was pointing to my picture, and he said, "That guy right there looks an 
off the lot like you. Thank you. Uh -huh. <laughs> Thank uh -huh. God for my fast thinking brain. My husband said, oh my gosh, that's my cousin. People are always getting us mixed up. And, <laughs> and, and later on, the dean said, said uh, the dean let Jones go without any further comment, but made clear that they both knew that he was lying. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm 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 going to try to share this picture. I know Matt Matt, our our guy who's handling this um this this event, he's going to try to to load the picture. But I'm a, I'm a, I'm going to try to show it here here on my phone if if I can get it in here. Oh, Matt Matt's going to share it. All right, so right here, all the way to the right side for the, everybody looking, all the way to the right side in the trench coat is Dr. Jones. Is that is that correct, Dr. Jones? It is, All the way to the right yeah, side. Shift it a little bit to your left. Uh, I'm looking. Now, uh, is, is this on the left side of the automobile or the right side? It, it'd be. As you approach in the period, I'm the last, last, the last person you see on the right. Yep. Yep. In the trench coat. That yeah. was my position. Yep, I I can see you. Can 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 you see that, Dr. Jones? Jack, can can y'all see that? I haven't okay. picked him out yet. I'm trying to all the way all the way to the right. He's the last guy to the right in the trench coat. All the way to the right. Okay, I got it. Half half, half of his body showing. That's him. Okay. <laughs> so. So what, once again, Dr. Jones, as, as we as we as we as we have this visual, uh, tell tell us one more time what's happening at this moment for for everyone who's who's on this Zoom Zoom as we're looking at this picture. What's happening? That light had been on as people congregated around the middle of the field. You could see in the background that's absolutely how dark it was. Mm -hmm. The only light we have in the background, as you can see, was the cars that left their lights on. Mm -hmm. Yep, this car yes, was illuminated by that single uh, light bulb. And uh, the guy in the middle is the guy who shot it out as a taller guy. And he uh, first puts it, it, but it looks to me like it's a rifle. Mm -hmm. Might like maybe a shotgun, but uh, yeah. uh, he, uh, he puts it against the wall. The, the, Wireless caller. Right. Let me. I'm sorry. I'm getting it. You're you're all right. So I'm I'm assuming Jack that they were planning on uh, doing what the KKK was famous for. They were going to burn a cross. Is is that is that what 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 the plan was? They were going to raise a cross and burn it. I That's think right. Jim didn't they have a platform there at some point? Wasn't there a platform up that they were going to? Well, they were going to burn a cross, as uh, the chairman said. And uh, and then we we were intent. The people I, that I had talked to were intent on not letting that happen. As you know, the Klan's way of 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 uh, thirst and fear in the hearts of people was to burn a cross, oftentimes followed by a lynching or something. And and the Lumbees that I talked to were intent on on that not happening. Uh, and, and indeed it did not. Uh, but uh, in the other statement that Jack made that, or maybe Mr. Chairman, you made a statement that the Klan was disbanded. In fact, uh, there has not been a major uh, Klan presence in North Carolina since the day, since this incident. So. Not only did we do a favor for our people, mm -hmm. so we were not going to be intimidated for uh, the, the uh, black people in North Carolina and elsewhere. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I, I, I think it's I think it's noteworthy that uh, given a situation of this kind, and Jim alluded to that a while ago. It's a wonder. It's a great wonder that somebody didn't get killed. I mean, it was a, it was a climate uh, 
and attitudes and everything else that was contributing to that thing that all those guns up there that night, it's almost amazing that somebody didn't get killed because uh, uh, the Lord must have been looking out for all of us. Maybe you, 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 you know what, Jack, I, I was, I was seriously, and as you were talking, you know, I know how our grandmothers are and our mothers, and I can imagine the prayers that were being sent um, uh, leading up to that event and that night um, as you guys were going out. And, and I have, I have no doubt um, that there were many prayers going up that night and the, the uh, good Lord answered every one of them uh, to protect everyone, you know, and, and, uh, and to ensure that no one was killed. So yes, sir. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, well, what's, what's amazing about it is with that many people up there and the clan being the center of attention, it would have been very easily for an Indian to have killed a Klansman and nobody would have known who did it. So yep. you had yeah. that, uh, you had that, uh, thing working in this crowd. Yes, and sir. We used to, even though we beat on some of them pretty severely, we used amazing restraint, mm -hmm. uh, against them having seen them come because, uh, if you did that again today in Robinson County, um, uh, well, if you did it again in Robinson County back at that time, it wouldn't have come out the way this did. Mm -hmm. Somebody was watching after us or something because you could have gotten away with doing a lot of bad things without having personal responsibility because of the crowd, the number of people involved and the, and the center of the people who you were after the clan. So we, we had an opportunity to do some real damage. And I think the Indian people ought to be applauded for for the restraint yes, that sir. we had that night. Absolutely, absolutely. I agree with that. So as we as we come upon the top of the hour, I do have a question that, that, I, that I want to, to ask both of you. Um, especially, I know, I know we have some, some younger folks here uh, who are listening in, some, some college age, some, some high school age. And, you know, I, I, I just wanna ask this, how, how did that night, um, Dr. Jones, how did it impact you and, and how did it help or did it help shape who you are today? Oh, uh, well, is that when I was growing up, <clears throat> uh, you were not taught to be proud to be a Lumbee. Uh, as a matter of fact, you oftentimes uh, didn't deny it, but you certainly didn't introduce yourself as a Lumbee Indian. Uh, we were taught to just uh, let let people find out if they wanted to, uh, but that you would uh, you would not go around uh, bragging about it. Uh, and so, to me though, it was kind of a response similar to the Black Lives Matter uh, after uh, this after this happened to me. I mean, I had always been proud and everybody in the, in, that I went to college with uh, knew that I was uh, Lumbee because uh, I made up Indian stories. I didn't have much Indian background. And in that day, there was no tribal, no formal tribe. There were no powwows to go to. I didn't know anything about Indian culture. So I made it up from movies I'd seen and books I'd read. And I pretend, pretended to know all of it. So they asked me if, if we if we ever went hunting. And I said, well, my brother and I used to go hunting uh, together. I'd run alongside of a deer, see if it was fleshy enough for him to shoot. Yeah. And so, uh, people will look, believe that was really Indian, the way Lumbees lived. So mm -hmm. I had a good time uh, with that, but, but after that, there was instilled in me and, uh, and I guess a lot of other people that it was, uh, I was proud to be uh, a Lumbee, so. so. Well, I think it, I think it impacted uh, my life from the standpoint that I recall Jim and I both, uh, when there used to be three water fountains in Lumberton, one for a white, uh, only uh, black uh, colored, they called it, and then the Indians. And so, we grew up uh, at a time when 
the prejudice was uh, much greater, of course, than it is now. And uh, grew up, um, and I used to say this thing, I, I was an Indian when it was, was, it was not popular mm -hmm. to be an Indian. Yeah. Now, you know, people brag about their, uh, their Indian heritage and this type of thing, which they should. But uh, this incident was a matter of pride for the Indian people. I, uh, they talked about us, but this is the one time that they saw the Lumbee tribe in action. Uh, and uh, I think uh, after that situation, we, grain, we gained some great degree of respect that we didn't have before. So from that vantage point, I think it was, it turned out to be a good thing for us and a bad thing for the Ku Klux Klan. But the Indian people came away from this situation with a greater feeling of pride than they had before this occurred. Mm -hmm. and that's that's how i felt personally too <clears throat> yes sir yes sir so um you know as we as we are looking back on these on the uh, 65 years and uh and uh and, and and just enjoying this time spent with with you all uh what are some some words what are some final words that you would you would leave with the next generation um uh, as we, as we move forward and, and, uh, you know, even though prejudice, uh, 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 prejudices are not as in your face as they were at the time. And, and even though our people have made leaps and bounds, um, you know, just, just, you know, as far as just overall social life, uh, what are some of the, um, what's the advice that you leave with us and with the next generations to come of Lumbee people? What, 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 what do you give to us for us to take forward over the next 30, 50, 100 years. Jim, uh, Chief, uh, if if I can step in, because Jim, I'd like for him to have the last word. He speaks yes, better sir. than I do. But um, I think what has what this has done for me and for the, the message that I leave with Lumbee people. Yes, sir. Because Jim and I came up the sort of in similar circumstances, and that were neither one of us was rich, and we had to work for everything that we got. I didn't even know you could borrow money to go to school. I had to work for my own education and I'm sure he did too. But I think the message to the Lumbee people, uh, my people, is don't sit around and wait for the government to sustain you. You need to get out and move on your own and do your own thing and accomplish your own objectives because if you wait around for the federal government to sustain us and support us, it's not a good thing for the people because our people lose their initiative if you sit around and wait for the government to support you. So my message would be, you know, get up, get out and get after it. If you want something, get after it and go out. Jim came up that way. He delivered papers when he was a kid. Uh, I had to work when I was a kid, uh, crop in the back and this type of thing. So it's a work ethic that I think that you need to develop and, and expand on in our tribe. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Dr. Well, Jones? <laughs> I don't dare, and that's exactly what I feel. Uh, to, to the absolute thing, it's, uh, you know, I, people mistake, uh, lump all minorities together and they think that uh, we just want to hand out and so forth. Uh, as Jack said, I've never wanted anything given to me. All I want is a fair chance. Mm -hmm. uh, if you put me side by side with uh, another person going after the same goal, if he or she is better qualified than I am, don't choose me just because I'm a Lumbee. I that would insult me. Uh, I wasn't. I wasn't uh, uh, half as good as the people that got admitted to Wake Forest. I was better than the majority of them or I would not even have been considered. Uh, I, on the other end, along the line, I was nominated to be Surgeon General of the United States, which is a great honor. But the guy who beat me out for that was an African, African American doctor that I knew way more qualified, had been 
dean of the medical school, had been head of the uh, uh, the uh, health uh, thing in Washington, and was much more better qualified. We become we became good friends, and he was one of the best surgeon generals this country's ever had. I would not have been able to do as well as he did, in my own opinion. So I don't ask to be given to, to move ahead in the line simply because I'm a lumbie. That should not be an expectation, but in my, I was raised by my grandmother, grandfather. My grandmother had been a one room school teacher. She taught us the value of education. And my grandmother taught me that education was a great equalizer. Mm -hmm. that, you, that if you uh, take the time to be educated, you will have something no one can ever take away from you. And that you will be able with your own initiative to find a lot of place the, the, your, what your place is in the world. And, and uh, I, the part I love about being uh, uh, a Lumbee Indian was I was raised in a very uh, faith based family. Mm -hmm. uh, my family took me to church every Sunday morning. Uh, my grandfather was treasurer of our church, and as he got older, the church asked me to help him out. and I, and I did, so I was very, I was uh, committed to give my life to God as a medical missionary, but I later became persuaded that that was not the right way to go. But our religious heritage and our democratic, our uh, democratic belief, uh, I, I'm sure uh, Attorney Lowry would agree with me, we're patriotic people. We love this country uh, and we would like, uh, we don't want to do anything to hurt it. So uh, I, we both will do anything we can, I'm sure, to help the generations that follow believe in themselves, go out and prepare themselves to make a difference in life. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, Gentlemen, Go ahead, I'm sorry. No, go, go ahead, go ahead, I heard a, I just wanted to carry on something about education that he alluded to there. And I heard a statement one time, you can't foreclose on an education. You can't take that back. No bank can take it away from you. Uh, you once you get an education, and like he said, it puts you on a level playing field. But uh, the initiative that we need to have as a tribe is we need to know that you have to get up and go get it yourself. You got to go after it. So yes, sir. that would be my message. Thank you very much. <clears throat> yes, sir. Yeah, I, I wrote, wrote that down, Jack. Get up, get going, get after it. So that <laughs> I, I have have that had that written down. Um, one of my uh, platforms when I ran for chairman was um, was to to work with others to help tell our stories. Um, it seems to me we have so many elders um, who leave this world um, and, and and they take they take a lot of a lot of knowledge with them. And so uh, and so just this past year we worked with the University of Florida uh, to do some 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 oral history um, uh, interviews and recording of our elders and. Uh, and to me, this here falls right right along with that, right? You know, we 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 talking to you guys, you guys telling us this story. We we've recorded it, and I know both of you have worked with with the with the uh, university in the past to also um, to also record your story as well. So for everyone watching, the University of North Carolina at Pembroke has has uh, uh, individual interviews with Mr. Jack, Dr. Jones, and a number of other uh, uh, a number of other individuals who were there that night. Uh, so. Uh, I just want to thank you, you both, for everything that, that you've done. In my, in my opinion, and and I think in the opinion of all the tribal members here, uh, you guys are trailblazers. You have truly walked the path that uh, that others have not walked, uh, and you've cleared it for us. And and I'm I'm just, I'm, I'm telling you, uh, I'm humbled. 
I'm humbled uh, to be on this call with you guys and 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 to hear your story. And uh, and you talk about pride. Uh, you guys had pride that night for what all you did. But I'm gonna tell you, I have pride right now for what all you you two guys have done. And uh, and so I'm just I'm just honored and humbled to be here today. And thank you for sharing the story. Thank you for educating our people. And thank you for being trailblazers that the two of you are. So thank you very much. Thank you for having me on. Uh, I appreciate it. And Jim, it's uh, it's an honor for me to be on the same program with you. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, sir. Uh, I want to thank you, Jack and, and John. I, I appreciate this opportunity. Yes, sir. Yes, I've been, sir. I've been well, given a lot. Yeah. And I, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to give back. Well, hey, let, let's let's set, set up set up a time when when we can get both of you back here together at the same time. So we're we're having John, Jack, and Jim uh, gathering, yeah, and, uh, and maybe, maybe maybe bring in the 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 uh, community and and uh, and we 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 can continue on having this this conversation. John, I'm looking forward to meeting you in person next yes. time I come in over there. I'll certainly come by and see you, and I, I appreciate it. And you've done a very good job. I hear you're taking care of things and. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you both. All right. Thank you to everyone who's joined us. Uh, uh, I hope you've really enjoyed this time. Um, and uh, hopefully, um, I know this has been recorded, so you can definitely share it with others, share it with family and friends. And uh, But I hope you've enjoyed the reflections of Hayes Pond and learning more about that night that the Lumbee tribe came together and ran the Clue Clux Clan out of Robinson County. So thank God. you all. God bless you. Yes, sir, Mr. Jenkins. One thing, John, I don't know how it got on there, but this program that is on YouTube, if you want to pick it up, I didn't know, but I, I found it on YouTube. All right. All right. Great stuff. Thank you all. Thank you all. Have a good evening. Thank you.